Jesus' name. And the church says, amen. Are you guys ready for Palm Sunday message? Come on, I get to bring the Palm Sunday message. This is so incredible. And, and this doesn't happen, you know, usually, but it did happen this, with this message. I was between two titles. So the first one's the one I actually used, and it's titled, Not What I Expected. Turn to your neighbor and say, Not What I Expected. The second one was Sweet and Sour Lamb. Oh, I guess that one's not a hit, right? Sweet and sour lamb. Okay, we'll get to that later. We'll get to the sweet and sour part and the whole lamb of God. But it was this Palm Sunday, such a sweet and sour moment for Jesus and everything that it entails. I need you to understand that this Sunday is a very, very important Sunday. Can I get an amen? Expectations are such a powerful thing. When you expect something and you don't get, it doesn't measure up to that which you expected, there is like that discouragement or there is a word called disappointment, right? Because you expected one thing and you got something less. But what, what happens when you expect one thing and you get more? Wow, that is so amazing. You're actually, it's like that awe moment. It's like, yes, wow, I expected great things, but I actually got even more than what I expected. People tend to complain more about something when you already have an expectation for it. For example, I'm a foodie, as you can tell. I give testimony. So I like to try different restaurants. We're actually a foodie family. And we read about people's opinions on places, and many times you go with these high expectations of what your experience is going to be, and for me, more importantly, it's what the food tastes like, right? And how, what happens when those plates come out and they're cold? Oh my gosh. They're, unless they're supposed to be cold, there's nothing worse for me than cold food, right? And you, you, we criticize that which we had expectations for and they don't meet up. We, have, we begin to criticize that because we love getting things our way. Can I get an amen to all you Starbucks orders? If we had a competition on the Starbucks orders, right, and what you order and at what temperature, babe, and with cinnamon powder on top and what type of milk and, and how many pumps of this and how many that, you know. And then we even expect them to give us a puppuccino for our dogs, right? I mean, what are you talking about when I go and you don't have a puppuccino? Like, right, we begin to criticize when our expectations are not met. But most times in life, we don't get what we expected. And this saying holds so true with God. Expect the unexpected with God. I hope this Sunday, you don't get what you expected. You get way more than what you expected. I hope with God, he leaves you surprised. You know what? I hope with God, he actually leaves you so amazed and even questioning a lot of things in the way that you had thought in the past about life, opinions, and everything. Because that's why we come to the word of God. So Matthew 20, 17 to 19, this is just moments before, or days before Palm Sunday. And this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. And he says this. Jesus, now well on the way up to Jerusalem, took the 12 off to the side of the road and said this. He said, listen to me carefully. Okay, this is just inside information. This is just for you guys. This is something I need to tell those closest to me. And he says this. We're on our way up to Jerusalem. But when we get there, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the religious leaders and scholars. They will sentence him to death. They will then hand him over the Romans for mockery and torture and crucifixion. But on the third day, I'm so glad he didn't stop speaking there. He said, but on the third day, something that will also happen is that he will be raised up alive. Can I get an amen? Come on, church. So I don't know if you knew this, but I thought it was a really cool fact that this was actually the third time he told this to his disciples. 
See, he talked about this to them. He, he let them know what was happening. And Jesus told his disciples after Peter's confession, when he asked, when Jesus was like, hey, who does everybody else say I am? Right? And then Peter was like the one that said, you are the Christ. And from that moment, that's when he's like, okay, you get it, Peter. You've seen it. So now I'm going to tell you guys what's going to happen. See, I have to die for you. See, my life is not going to be taken away. I'm going to give my life for you. But don't be dismayed because I'm going to come alive on that third day. And then the second time he said it, after the mountain of transfiguration, when he had that moment with God, right, and he took up three of his closest disciples, so then he, he actually healed a young boy. And after that, he goes, I got to tell you guys again. I got to remind you because you guys might love this way too much. You might want to hold on to me for way too long. And I got to let you know what my purpose in life is here on earth. So now Jesus takes them to one side for this last time. Say with me, for this last time. Yes, the third time. And he, set, he seeks to stress to them what's going to occur. Jesus knew exactly, exactly what was to occur. It didn't surprise him. He wasn't caught off guard. He knew exactly that he was headed to Jerusalem to die. Our Jesus is voluntarily, he's voluntarily moving forward to Jerusalem He's voluntarily taking steps towards his death and suffering, knowing that it will be there and on the cross that he will complete his mission. You know, most times I want to know what's going to happen. I'm one of those people that there's a movie and I'm like, I, if I know somebody's seen it, I'm like, hey, can you tell me the end? I won't tell anybody you told me. I'm one of those. Yes, I'm one of those. I just, and, and I don't, won't tell anyone. I won't, I, I won't ruin it for you. But I just can't, I can't sit through the movie and wonder if he's actually going to realize that it's her. And it's been her the entire time. I just want to know, you know. But I think in this moment, I would have rather not known. Because how easy it is, is it to move towards something that is good. But how hard is it to keep on moving towards something that means your death. That means your suffering. And that's what Jesus did. See, there is no doubt about his purpose. Jesus fully understood who he was and what he had to come to do. Jesus knew full well that he was born, that that's what he was born for, to die. See, we are born for a purpose. But our death is just the beginning of our eternal life. But Jesus knew that for that to happen, he had to die. So it's crucial that we understand today that we would see Palm Sunday and understand that nothing was left to chance when it comes to Jesus. And nothing is left to chance when it comes to your life. See, nothing just happens. There's no coincidences. But Jesus also was never a victim. He was never a victim. Don't, don't pity Jesus. Don't feel sorry for Jesus. There's so many people to this day that see Jesus crucified and they cry at his feet. But then we're missing the entire point because Jesus was not a victim. He didn't hang there. He didn't hang there in shame. He hung there and, 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 and let the whole world know that he gave his life for you and me. Can I get an amen? And this is so crucial that we understand that everything that was meant to happen, happened. That his life was not taken, it was given. That he was always in full control, directing, never following. Every detail of his life was lived on purpose for that very moment on Calvary. Up to his last breath that in the book of Luke says, it is finished. See, up to his last breath with those last words when he's hanging there and he says, it is finished. Basically said, I dropped the mic. See, I dropped the mic. There's nothing else for me to do here on earth. Come on, church. So Jesus knew his Bible because he was the living word walking and breathing, right? It says he is the verb. He is the incarnate 
right word of God. So he knew everything. He knew what the Old Testament had said needed to happen. He knew he needed to die for our sins, for a world that couldn't pay him back. Jesus knew that he would have to fulfill each and every one of the prophecies. And I could, I could show it to you and I could prove it to you with his life. See, Exodus 12, 40 says, it predicted that none of the Messiah's bones would be broken. And usually anybody who died on a cross, their bones were broken at the end just to make sure that they really did suffocate. But his bones were never broken. And then it says in Psalms eleven twelve 12, that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And that's exactly what happened. Psalms 13, 7 says that he would be deserted by his friends. Psalms 22, 16 said he would be pierced while on a cross. Psalms 69, 21 says he, he was going to be given gall to drink. Psalms 22, 1 says that he would cry out of pain. And Psalms 22, 18 says that lots would be cast for his garments. The, pro, the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before he pre predicted that he would come in Isaiah 53, which is called the song of the suffering servant, says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. This was 700 years before Jesus was on that cross, and Jesus met every single one of those. See, my point is this, maybe it's too much word for you to even have written down. But my point was not for you to write down those verses. My point was for you to get this, that Jesus was in full control. That while he was on his way to his death, he was in full control. On that first day of the week, and according to ancient rabbis, it was at that very moment, on that very day in the temple, that they were actually singing a psalm of David. And this is what that psalm did. The people that didn't believe in Jesus, on that day, on that first Sunday, they were singing this. Lift up your head, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the king of glory. And this was being sung in the temple. Come on, church. While he was riding in a donkey. Also fulfill in prophecy of Zechariah when it said that the king would ride into Jerusalem in a donkey. And see, he was so welcomed in that moment. A Jesus that lived most of his life trying to not put too much spotlight on himself. Now all of a sudden needed all the spotlight to be put on him. He needed the sweet and sour moment. He needed to ride into Jerusalem. See the crowds yelled, Hosanna. The crowds yelled, Hosanna. And they said this. In the highest heaven, Hosanna means save now. And they were yelling as he came into Jerusalem. And I always wondered why then. If it was such a happy moment, if it was such a sweet moment, why does the sour come into play? See, it's because not what we expected. The word of God actually says that when Jesus rode in, he looked at Jerusalem and wept. Because although the crowd shouted Hosanna, they didn't get it. They still didn't get it. They had eyes, but they could not see. See, when they were shouting, save now, they were shouting for a Jesus to save them on their own terms. See, they were saying, save now. I need you to go and become king. Overthrow the Romans. We need you to be that Messiah. We need you to come in with the Calvary. We need you to come in and liberate us from being slaves or, or from these high taxes. See, they were calling on Jesus, but they were saying, save us now on our terms. And isn't that the way we come to Jesus? So many times. Lord, I need you to save this part of my life, but, but please don't touch this other part. 
I don't need you for that, see? I can take care of that on my own. I like that part. I'm, I'm really not ready for you to, 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 to sit on the throne on that part of my life. And we ask God and we say, save now, Lord, save now. And there is Jesus watching them praise him and watching them wave the palm branches and calling upon him. But yet he wept. See, he wasn't there to overthrow the Romans and save them from the Romans. He was there to save them from themselves. He wasn't there to be the king that they thought they needed. He showed up that day to be the king he knew they needed. And he knew that those same people that were glorifying his name and, and calling upon him, that when he didn't do as they wanted, days later, they would say, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, because he is a liar. See, Jesus was crucified because the people were angered, that he, they were angry with him. Have you ever been angry with God for something? Have you ever put your fist up at God and ask him why? See, but God was in full control. We began with that point from the very beginning. See, Jesus was always in control. He knew exactly what had to happen and when it had to happen. And even that, even in that moment, and we'll talk about that next Sunday on Easter, but he still kept moving forward. He still kept moving forward, even though we ask him to be a Jesus that we think we need. See, he can't be anything else than the Jesus that he knows that we need. And that is the Savior for our sins. That is to rip us out of hell and put us into heaven. If that means he has to hang on a cross, if that means he has to suffer, if that means that even for moments you would turn your back on him because that's what they did. If that means that even for a moment you would tune your back on him, he would do it again. Because see, he, he needed to save you. He loved you so much that even before, even while you were still in sin, even while you couldn't love him back, he said, I'm moving forward. I'm headed to Jerusalem because I have something to do. I need to rip my children out of hell and I need to bring them to 